scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. With faith in your heart, faith in your spirit. Lord, we give you praise. Because you are moving in our midst, moving over our destinies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me give you one more prayer point and then we'll sit down. Father, let me be a sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder. Not just to walk signs and wonders, but that you become a sign and a wonder. A living epistle. Go ahead and pray. Pray from the depth of your heart. Someone is praying. A sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder, a mystery that explains Jesus, a mystery that explains your wisdom, your power, your favor, your grace, an embodiment of the possibilities of the kingdom. Go ahead and pray. Turn my life to a sign and a wonder, a sign and a wonder, a sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder. A sign and a wonder. Spiritual sign and wonder. An intellectual sign and a wonder. A financial sign and a wonder. A career sign and wonder. Go ahead and pray. The Bible says, for everyone that asketh, receive it. Shadebekepakarus, skata prakabalakata fraskebeleketa, kebranta kaparaskata fraskebelekebaratus yata. That your life becomes a living epistle, an epistle of wonder, an epistle of grace, an epistle of faith. For in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray it's important that we understand God's goal for us in our lives and as far as our destiny is concerned God is about doing something in your life and it's important you know you understand what he is doing hallelujah when you understand what God is doing, you can be patient. When you understand what God is doing, you can be discerning. When you understand what God is doing, it fuels faith and it fuels gratitude. God's goal for us is to make us objects of praise. That your life becomes a, a holistic capture of what God can do with a man who decides to be yielded. Your assignment is to know this and to cooperate with God. This is why you are here tonight. 
I taught you last week that your being here, among other reasons, is an expression of your commitment that you are still interested in the making process. You are still interested in becoming, evolving. You are still interested in becoming that vessel that can host God's power. And I pray for you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ that now that you have come here, may that which God has in store for you tonight not pass you by. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let those who are downcast tonight find hope. Let those who are sick tonight experience the miracle working power of Jesus. Let those who have been tied down by all kinds of satanic assaults, this is the house of God. May you experience the liberating power of the Spirit. Let those who have been victims of darkness, the Bible says that was the true light that lighted upon every man. When it is the true light, every man can be a participant. Every man can be a recipient. May his light rest upon your life. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. Welcome to church. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Never stop yielding yourself to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Never stop yielding yourself to the ministry of His Word. Your flesh, your body may be tired, fatigued, especially on account of the vicissitudes of life and the reality of the times. But you must have a determination before you. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, calls him the author and the finisher of our faith and the bible mandates that we study that character who for the joy that was set before him there is always a joy that is set before every believer the bible says he endured the cross and he despised the shame it says for our light afflictions he says which is but for a moment that it worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That while we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Romans 8 and verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So there is something God is doing in your life. It takes time oh, for God to build people. It takes time for that vessel of glory to emerge. Hallelujah. No matter how healthy a mother is, she does not get pregnant in one day and give birth to the child one day. Hallelujah. From the day they tell her, Madam, you are pregnant, she's still going to be patient. There is a time allotted for that pregnancy. That's how it is in the spirit. You are carrying something that is heavy. You are carrying something that is weighty. There is a formation of Christ in you. And it's taking a while. There is a man of God that is evolving out of this sacrifice. There is an intercessor that is evolving. There is a financial apostle evolving. A career giant evolving. Are we together? Yeah. There is a prophet evolving. There is an apostle evolving. There is an exceptional, uncommon leader evolving. There is a general overseer evolving. Hmm. There is a sign and a wonder like you just prayed evolving. But the question is that are you patient enough to allow the Spirit of God finish what he is doing? Hallelujah. No matter how hungry you are, when they tell you the food is on fire, you wait. What do you do? You wait. You can roam around the wait. Wait. By the time the cook is done, they package it beautifully and you have the luxury of eating to your field. This is what the Spirit of God is doing. He's building something within your life. 
while that building is happening you may not seem to have the kind of money you want you may not seem to have the kind of influence you want you may not even see prophecy manifest yet maybe the church may not be growing as, as you want it. Maybe the business may not be growing. Maybe your destiny will feel halted, stagnated. But don't, listen, don't give in to the temptation of Satan. Satan is a master of the sense realm. He knows that once you become sensual, you are in his domain. The Bible says to be spiritually minded. Hallelujah. It says for to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. The moment you reduce yourself to the level of carnality, you start calculating your destiny mathematically, calculating your destiny sociologically, it will not add up. And the end of it is that you will be discouraged and you may not immediately see the profit in serving God, the profit in living for Him. So my first charge for us tonight is that you must realize that the Holy Spirit is on a journey with you. You can choose to tell Him, I'm tired tired of church, tired of growth, tired of spirituality, tired of pressing in, tired of persistence, and because he is God, he will respect your will. At the point you become exhausted and you do not need his help or you're not interested in continuity, he will respect you. But with that privilege will come catastrophic consequences. It is better to not start the journey than to start and not arrive. Are we together? What good was it for the nation of Israel when they left Egypt and only two people among those who left entered the promised land? They would have as well just grown old and died in Egypt. We are not of them that draw back. When you set your hand on the plow, you obtain grace. Obtain grace. And when you become tired and weary, you don't go back. You cry for help. You know why the Holy Spirit is called a helper? There are two assignments of help. Number one, to make things possible. Number two, to make things easy. This is the assignment of help. Every time you call for help, it is because you want things to become possible and you want them to become easy. So if I'm to lift this alone, if I ask someone to come and help me, number one, it makes what was once impossible now become possible then it makes it easy or easier that's the assignment of the Holy Spirit when you call on him as a helper he comes to your life and guarantees that that which God has shown you must come to pass and then number two he eases the journey he does that among many other ways by comforting you he's called a comforter he does that by restoring you. He restores my soul. Hallelujah. Make up your mind that you have begun this journey with the Holy Spirit and there is no going back until that glory manifests in you. Is God speaking to someone tonight? The Bible says, now are we the sons of God. Listen carefully. It says, and it doth not yet appear. My God, I pray that you believe this. That it doth not yet appear. You can count how many fruits come from a tree, but you cannot count how many trees will come from one fruit. The fruits that you find in a tree, no matter how many, they are countable. But you cannot count how many trees can come from a fruit. And that fruit is your life. The Spirit of God is working, incubating possibilities. And you just allow that spiritual gestation period to be full. And you watch the sign and a wonder that you become. That you look at your former self and you cannot find it again. You are changed. Changed to a man of power. Changed to a man of wisdom. Changed to a man of courage. Are we together? Changed to a man of light. Change to a man of wealth. Change to a man of grace. When men look at your life, your life becomes an explanation to a question they have been asking God. That every time men ask God certain questions, he refers them to your life. Your life becomes an answer to many people's questions. When they look at you, you are grace embodied. Chapter 2, please. Joel chapter 2, beginning from verse 23. The latter rain. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, 
and rejoice in the Lord your God for he had given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain even the former rain and the latter rain in the first month reading to 27 as a result of that rain the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and with oil and I will restore to you still on account of that rain the years that the locusts had eaten the canker worm the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you 26 and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wondrously with you I like this it says and my people shall never be ashamed and my people shall never be ashamed final verse 27 and ye shall know by all of these evidences that I am in the midst of Israel that I am the Lord your God and none else. And again he repeats, my people shall never be ashamed. We are in the days of his power. Settle this for a fact. Let it be distilled upon your spirit man that we are in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. We are in the days of his power. We are in the days of strange revivals, strange awakenings, outpourings of the Spirit. The days where the power of God is ready to be on full display like never, like never before. The Bible says in Psalm 110, Psalm 110, 110 verse 3 I believe, it says the people shall be willing in the days of thy power the people shall be willing in the days of thy power i have seen these formations and right now like droplets it is beginning to amplify from nigeria parts of africa across europe you know down west the spirit of god is moving with full force as we begin to prepare to wrap up this church age as we know the Spirit of God knows that there is still much to be done and there is an acceleration system in the Spirit and that is coming through and outpouring there are end time anointings there are end time mantles there is a quickening that is happening to the Saints like never before accelerated trainings by the Spirit of God because of the urgency that is at hand so settle it for a fact that we're in the days of his power. A day where we will see the manifest power of God in the midst of his people. Culminating to salvations, healings, territorial transformations like never before. And let me tell you the truth. The purpose of announcing this to you is to remind you that you are part of that army. If we are in the days of his power, then it's important for you to know that the power of God depends on how many vessels are willing and are aligned to be endued with that power. I said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. All through scripture and even from modern history, we see moments of awakenings, moments of outpourings, moments of signs and wonders where territories were literally held at a standstill because a few people, individuals sometimes, or groups of people who were able to align with the spirit, they carried strange fires and they blazed that fire throughout their time, throughout their cities. Are we to talk of the Wells Revival or the Azusa Street Revival or many that have come before us? And now, even in modern history, men and women who shook nations, history books are full of their exploits. Unfortunately, some history did not do justice to the level and the extent of power that they carried. We only know what history told us about them. But we know for a shorty that with the kind of alignment that these men and women had towards God, they must have done greater than what history told us. 
and now there is a new page in the spirit that has been opened it's time to write someone else's story because that book did not stop that archive of wonder walking miracle workers that 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 history book in the spirit it was supposed to be a continuation the apostles wrote their own the patriarchs wrote their own everyone now the page is open for you and my assignment tonight is to guide you and to help you see that in truth we are in the days of his power and there is a latter rain a latter rain a latter rain that is pouring upon the spirit upon the nations the inhabitants Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 15 the Bible says until the spirit be poured upon us from on high until the spirit like rain be poured upon us from on high and then the wilderness a destiny that is as a wilderness a nation that is as a wilderness a family that is as a wilderness be counted for a fruitful field and a fruitful field be counted for a forest let me paint for you a little picture of what an outpouring looks like let me paint for you a picture of what a season of prophetic awakening looks like because for many of us we do not have an idea what does it look like how do I know that this is a season of outpouring what does it look like in agriculture most of us know when the season of a harvest comes you know how the crops look you see how busy the farmers are you also know how a planting season looks like those who are students you know how it is when school resumes and you know how it is when there is holiday so you can literally look at a picture and tell what season it is when you see a school empty without any word of knowledge you just say they are most likely having holidays when you see a lot of students they most likely have resumed you can look at the atmosphere and the spirit and you can tell with precision because there are events that follow the prophetic speakings of God. So let me paint for you a picture. What does it look like when God is moving? What does it look like when the spirit of God finds unrestrained access through a life, through a church, through a ministry, through a vision, through a family, through a destiny, through a business, through a territory what does it look like what does the move of God look like what does a season of signs and wonders look like what happens show me a picture of an individual who is experiencing a revival and an outpouring if you do not have that picture you will lose out on prophecy and lose out on seasons it says the Lord was in this place and I knew not what does a season of outpouring look like number one the season of outpouring comes with a manifestation of mighty works mighty works in and through the saints the season of outpouring is a season of mighty works the season of the latter rain when the Holy Ghost moves upon a people it culminates to mighty works it's a season of extraordinary manifestations what does an outpouring look like a season of greater influence where the church gains ascendance and their influence becomes incontestable even within their world not just from a spiritual standpoint that the church gains visibility like we find in Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 and 3 the Bible says it shall come to pass repeated also in Micah that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it I like verse 3 verse 3 says and many people not few many people and outpouring is a, is a season where multitudes are affected by the influence of the spirit it does not happen to a few the training may be for a few but an outpouring affects multitudes in the day on the day of pentecost the bible says three thousand souls 
in one service came to Jesus. The season of the latter rain is a season of mighty works, not mighty discussions about works, doing exploits by the Spirit. The season of the latter rain is characterized by greater witness. Greater witness. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. The Bible says, and with great power. Acts, did I get that right? 433. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, my God, great grace was upon them all. The season of the latter rain comes with grace to be a witness like never before. To bear witness to the truth. John chapter 1, 6 and 7. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Verse 7, it says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That man through his witness, the abundance, the quality of his witness might believe. Witness with signs, witness with wonders, manifestations of miraculous, you know, occurrences of the Spirit. John chapter 20, 30 and 31, the Bible says many other miracles, signs, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. Next verse, but these are written. They were documented that when you read them, you might believe in truth that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and that in believing, you will have life through his name. Let me tell you the truth. One-on-one -on -one evangelism as we know it will not get the job done. There needs to be an outpouring that will save nations in one day. There needs to be a move of the Spirit that can bring systems and structures under pressure in one day there are about 8 billion people and counting on earth and last I checked there are about 2.8 there about professing Christians both serious and unserious and you match that ratio one on one no the job will not be done the laws of our land today the realities of the time the growing hatred and wickedness for the body of christ may not allow even the luxury of contact in certain nations there has to be another kind of formula that will bring the harvest hmm. are we learning the latter rain the seasons of our pourings are before us i'm still painting the picture of what an awakening and outpouring a season of revival a move of the spirit what does it look like the season of outpouring always comes with greater salvation massive salvation of souls massive salvation of souls beyond the effort of crusades beyond the effort of tracts a move of the spirit that you see men being saved sometimes without any physical human being talking to them visions in the similitude of that which happened to paul and people individuals who in their salvation will be the salvation of a decapolis one man got saved and 10 cities were saved because of him one woman was saved and she ran left her water pot and said come see a man who told me everything I've done? Let me tell you the truth. There are individuals that Satan is fighting their salvation. Some of them are locked up in your family. The reason is because in their salvation will be the salvation of over 10 million other people. 100 million other people. The impact of their conversion testimony can be books that will save others. The impact of their conversion testimony can be messages, volumes of series that will bring many to Jesus and Satan will fight with everything he has when he fights a man from being saved he's not fighting one man he's fighting everybody to be saved through that man hmm. hallelujah so when you see your father refusing to be saved 
your mother refusing to be saved, your siblings refusing to be saved, or people around your family refusing, it's not just the hardness of their heart, it's that there is a weakness locked up in the midst of that rebellion, and Satan is fighting because with the same zeal they served him, that is the same zeal they will serve God, ask Paul. Paul had so much zeal, he went to the high priest to collect letters to persecute the people of God. But when that man encountered God, he flipped over with the same passion. Hmm. The same passion. The same passion. Outpourings culminates to genuine salvation. Can I tell you the truth? Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. Every territory is at the mercy of the number of people saved within that territory. For as long as there are only few people saved within a territory, it means that there are many bodies Satan can use to fight the purposes of God. He says, a body has thou prepared for me. When we advocate the salvation of men and the salvation of territories, it is because Satan or any spirit for that matter depends on the availability of destinies and bodies for their purposes and their agenda to find expression. When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Did you hear what I said? When it has to do with the business of salvation, numbers matter. Having five people saved genuinely and growing and having 1,000 people saved genuinely and growing, the spiritual impact will not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. Not be the same. For as long as as our territories are full of godless people, full of people who really do not know God, or full of people who are not even interested. Do you know, Satan will do all within his power to exalt those people to positions where they become a thorn in the flesh to God's program. Satan loves people who are available and are not saved. Do you know why? He places them in positions where he makes it difficult for the witness of the saints to penetrate that environment. Hallelujah. And this is one of the reasons why we must contend we are in the business of the souls of men. We are in the business of the souls of men. Let me repeat it again. We are in the business of the souls of men. Every single soul that Jesus died for matters as far as God's end time program is concerned. The average believer is not conscious of soul winning. We do it sometimes just to ease the guilt of religion and so that it doesn't look like we're not serious with God. But most people have not caught the burden in the heart of God for souls. You don't have to be an evangelist. You just need to understand God's program. Hallelujah. And unfortunately, let me press a bit on this soul winning. Unfortunately, and I think it's something that I pray God will restore to the body. Because... The ratio of the passion that is in the average man of God, and I say this with all due respect, and the average church to see souls saved is below average. We need to trust God for grace. You can do, you can sing, you can dance, you can act drama, you can teach powerfully. If souls are not saved, then the kingdom is not advancing at the pace that should be. Because the journey of every believer first starts with an encounter with the God of the Bible. The journey of the believer does not start with a dexterous teaching ministry. The journey of the believer does not start with receiving miracles. The journey of the believer does not start with welfare. The journey of the believer does not start with good singing and excellence and administration. The journey of the believer does not start with career intelligence. No. In order of spiritual priority, there is only one spiritual process that converts an unbeliever to become a believer. And that is an encounter not with a man of God, not with an angel, not with a rhema, 
an encounter with the son of the living God. The Bible says, he that hath the son hath life. And he that does not have the son does not have life. And I'm praying that God will grant us as men of God the grace to focus, to get back to our assignments and see that there is urgency and work in partnership with the Holy Spirit, taking advantage of this outpouring to see to it that the people who sit under our care truly become saved. Are we together? It is easy for Satan to distract us with all kinds of things provided it will not lead to salvation. Let me tell you this, Satan hates salvation. Satan hates men being saved. Satan hates men finding the truth. He hates men coming to Jesus in genuine brokenness and repentance to receive his life. Satan will prefer a healing service than a service that leads people to Jesus because everybody Jesus healed still died. Everybody Jesus fed still died. Everybody Jesus taught still died. There is only one guarantee for life and meaning beyond this realm, an encounter with the Son of the living God. You believe that? Shout aloud, Amen. Amen. No matter how successful we are, real success in life, in ministry, and in destiny is measured by how many people came to Jesus through your life before other things. Other things are important, but not as important as salvation. I rather someone does not get healed, but get saved. You see that? When I go to pray for people, particularly if they have terminal diseases, my first port of call is not to pray for healing. My first port of call is to guarantee that they are saved. And if they are not, I preach Jesus to them immediately. Because if for any reason I pray for them and they are not healed, and I hear that they've passed on to glory, my greatest joy is that they finally cheated life. But if I pray for someone and they say, oh, the cancer went, this one went, and the person is not saved, I did not do much. Let me educate you believers. In order of spiritual priority, God's ultimate passion is number one, that all men be saved first, then that they come to the knowledge of the truth. You cannot bring people to the knowledge of the truth who are not saved. Beyond a dexterous teaching ministry, beyond an apostolic and a prophetic ministry characterized by great signs and wonders the first objective of the outpouring is to bring a harvest to jesus let me repeat for your learning the first objective of the outpouring the first objective behind the outpouring of the spirit the latter rain is to see to it that many come to the saving knowledge of jesus there is the healing knowledge, there is the prospering knowledge, but in order of priority, the saving knowledge of Jesus. I rather not perform any miracle in my life as a man of God. I rather not have the grace for revelation and illumination to teach. If all I know is the gospel in its simplicity and I'm able to teach as childlike and as simple as possible, it will, it will translate to a harvest of millions of souls within the time God has given me. I would consider myself an extreme success versus performing great signs and wonders, prophesying to people profitably so, ministering the word, dishing out revelation series after series, and then at the end of it, there is a pile of unsaved people who are learned about spiritual things. It is dangerous when someone has not met Christ, but has met church. Because there's almost nothing you would tell them, they will recite your revelation for you, but they have not encountered Jesus. Are we together? Yeah. Church can be a culture that you learn, like English, like Yoruba, like Hausa. You can learn the culture of church, and yet you've not met the King of Kings. You can speak it. How are you welcome to church today? You can speak it. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2, and yet you have not encountered Christ. You can learn church like a career. The same way you study mathematics, engineering, you can study church. The greatest and the highest objective of the outpouring is to see that people are translated 
from the kingdom of darkness, ladies and gentlemen, and those people include our family members, our unsaved ones, distant or otherwise, that they come into a saving, functional knowledge of Jesus. I'm praying that someone seated here who has been crying for power, crying for miracles, I'm praying for you that in the name of Jesus, you will reprioritize your passion, that the passion to see the lost come to Jesus will become the driving force behind your need for power, the driving force behind your need for a large congregation, the driving force behind your need for more money, the driving force behind your need for greater influence. Whatever it is that you seek, if it is not tied to the restoration of men to God, then you are asking amiss. Are we learning? Still painting the picture of what an outpouring looks like. Hmm. What comes with an outpouring? Increase and abundance. This is true. Every genuine outpouring of the spirit does not just affect the spiritual lives and the spiritual health in order of priority souls coming to Jesus, lives transformed, territories transformed, but it always culminates to increase and abundance. All through modern history and even from scripture, every time there was an outpouring, it started by repentance and brokenness and then the Lord heard them and the Lord healed the land. If my people, the Bible says, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Listen, it says, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. But I will not just stop at forgiveness. I will heal their land. The healing of the land talks of prosperity. That God breathes his life again upon the territory. Many years ago, I watched a video about the revival and the restoration that happened in Fiji Island. It was so touching. It was such a blessing to me. It inspired me. I watched how that because of the rebellion of the people, I think they murdered some missionaries or something like that. And an indignation rose to heaven. And everything that produced within that territory, based on that documentary, it ceased. The fish stopped multiplying in the river. The earth stopped bringing its increase. And the people got sad. One time, a group of intercessors, prayer warriors, they began to pray for a restoration and revival within the Fiji island. And the Spirit of God ministered to them that there were certain things that needed to be put in place if they wanted to see the power of God come. And they looked for the grandchildren of those missionaries they killed, invited them over in the land, apologized to them nationally. And then they said when they finished by, was it the next day or the next week? I can't remember exactly. The river was flooded with fish. This is a documentary I watched. God heals the land. God can prosper men. Let me tell you the truth. And I'm not a prophet of doom. But in scripture, there are times that famine and economic toil, turmoil comes as a result of the sins of the people. Go and read your Bible. That when people sin against God territorially, corporately, when they become proud and full of themselves, among the many ways God draws them is to touch the economy of that territory. It's true. Because when people, when it affects their eating and their drinking, they can now listen to God. Something happens when people are full. To hell with God, they will say. So, any nation and any territory that begins to find out that economically speaking, things are going down. Among the many policies that must be enacted is genuine repentance to say something is wrong. If the earth is reacting, the atmosphere is reacting. These are forces that are alive. They react. They react. It was on account of the sins of the people that Elijah prayed and there was no rain. You see that until Christ, until God, Jehovah was enthroned again. Look at the land of Samaria. Go and read your Bible. Every time you see that it's not every economic problem, but many times when you find out that territories come under economic hardship 
among many other reasons is that an indignation has risen to God and there is a response from heaven. Do you believe that? Joel chapter 2. Give us verse 25. Watch what happens. Joel 2, 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army. Aha, uh -huh, 26. Now next verse. It says, and ye shall eat in what? And be satisfied. This also follows outpourings. When the latter rain comes, it affects every aspect of your life. Unfortunately for most believers, the moment we find ourselves in extreme levels of lack and plenty, especially when you have done everything to do right. I'm not talking about people who are lazy. I'm not talking about people and, te and territories that are non-productive. When you do everything right, and you do not catch fish maybe you need to step back to a point of brokenness to say Lord something is wrong this business has the best minds there there is no increase this shop has the best people this mall we have put everything in place maybe we need to get back could it be that there is a deviation from the ways of God I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land Hallelujah. Salvation of territories. The latter rain brings with it higher dimensions in the spirit. Higher dimension. There is an ascendance. The saints rise to higher levels of the anointing. Greater command of spiritual power. Greater command of spiritual power. Greater command of spiritual power. I'm just painting for you a picture of what a move of God looks like. I'm using all those indices to paint for you a picture. This is, this is how you know that God is moving within a place. If these things are not happening, then the move of God is not happening. It is impossible for the move of God to be happening within a territory and you do not see these things. No. There has never been a genuine move of God that does not capture these indices. Greater command of power. Are we together? A greater manifestation of repentance, brokenness, sinners coming to Jesus, growth, a, a, a flooding of light that the saints command greater spiritual illumination. Signs and wonders influence the influence of the church rising. The world working for people manifestations of signs and wonders and i'm praying in the name of jesus christ that in my lifetime and your lifetime we will see these things return again yeah. that the move of god that is already starting that at its greatest momentum we will not only witness it we will become privileged vessels that will be used to produce that you believe that shout a loud amen yeah. let me tell you this it will be a painful thing in this end time to be a spectator of what God is doing. Wow. Look at what God is doing with people. And God says, what of you? The latter rain. Now, I wrote two things here and I want you to write them down. Then we'll go into the weight of this discussion tonight. Number one. God will never force or impose his program on anyone. Please write that down. God will never force or impose his program. That includes his end time program. God will never force or impose his program upon anyone. It is inconsistent with his character. In as much as God desires an outpouring, in as much as it's part of God's prophetic program in this season, that the nations be saved, that his power be revealed, that the saints be elevated to higher levels of grace, God will never impose his program. God will never impose his program on an individual and on a people. The reason is because he created us and gave us the exclusive ability to choose. 
And isn't it amazing that even at the detriment of your eternal destiny, you can choose that God should live your life alone and he will respect you. There are people today who have had the gospel. It was preached to them. And they looked at the person preaching and said, congratulations, shake my hand. I've had everything, but as an act of my will, I reject you and reject Jesus. God will respect them. He will respect their refusal of him. But there are consequences with every decision. Please hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Just because God intends for a mighty move to rest upon Nigeria, upon Africa, upon the nations of the earth, upon your family, upon your business, upon your destiny, it does not mean that prophetic word will come to pass. And the first reason is that God never imposes anything. Let this give you wisdom already. God can prevail upon men and he can be patient until they get to a point of conviction because of the sensitivity of their assignment. But God never usurps your will to impose anything. The moment you begin any journey that makes it look like it's by force with God, discern again. That is not the character of God. I can choose today as an act of my will that as I drop down from this pulpit, I don't want to be a Christian again. I can choose as an act of my will that I don't want to be a man of God again. God will not just say, okay, go. He will say, no, 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 many destinies are tied to you. So God will prevail upon me. But after a persistent period, if he sees that my decision was an act of my will, not manipulation from demon spirits, I use my will to reject him and reject his program. He will raise another person and allow me together with the consequences of my rebellion. That's how God works. Can I tell you, in this end time, there are many people who will carry the bishopric of others because there are people who have been destined. There are families that have been destined. God cannot delay the rising of many because of the carelessness of a few. If you are the one God is raising to be a prophet, and let's say God has apportioned 10 million souls to your prophetic ministry, and you refuse to align, you refuse to love God, you refuse to allow yourself to be malleable, 10 million souls cannot suffer because of your carelessness. God will honor you, but he will bypass you and raise somebody else. I've taught you here, in this end time, you will see people carrying burdens and assignment that was not part of the original script God gave them because they have so aligned they still have the stamina to take more responsibility hallelujah may no one replace you I'm praying for you may God not become tired of waiting for you that you will have to raise a replacement for you. If you are the one ordained to bring your family to the saving knowledge of Jesus, this is a clarion call as you are listening. God is merciful, he's patient, but he's also loving. And his love exceeds all his other attributes. In fact, God is love. God is not mercy. God is not kindness, but he is love. He shows mercy. He shows kindness. But the epitome of who he is in one word is love. And God would rather one person face the consequence of his carelessness and decision than nations come under the judgment of the carelessness of one person. This is how God works. Are you understanding me so far? So for someone you are seated and God is saying, how long? Do you know that by now, if you had stayed with me, there are certain graces you should be walking in now. By now, that apostolic ministry, that prophetic ministry, that evangelistic ministry, that ministry of kingdom financing, maybe based on your prophetic blueprint, if you had worked with God sincerely, by now you would have accessed the measure of wealth to now begin to serve God's program. But you are just beginning. And God is saying, no, it should not be like this. He's calling you. 
and he's telling you it's time to stop giving excuses to brace up your spirit for an encounter that translates you to a mighty vessel and I pray for you help them please in the name that is above all names I'm praying for you whatever is causing the spiritual laxity that cancer that is eating up your spirit that will not allow that new wine to emerge let it die this night let it die this night let it die this night in the name of Jesus Christ Please be seated. Please be seated. So I told you to write this, that God will never force or impose his program on anyone. Number two, the manifestation, write this down please, the manifestation of God's desire and plan upon the earth depends on the availability the willingness and the yieldedness of the saints. Let me repeat myself. You have to put this down. The manifestation of God's desire and God's plan on the earth depends on the availability, depends on the willingness and depends on the yieldedness. These are three words you should never forget availability willingness and yieldedness of the saints if this that we are saying must happen in our lives in our nation in our churches in our groups in our territories in our businesses in our endeavors it's important for us to know that the manifestation of God's desire and his plan upon the earth depends on the availability depends on the willingness depends on the yieldedness of the saints Isaiah 6 8 the prophet encounters the God of the Bible and among the many things that happen to him when we get to verse 8 he says also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us whom shall I send and who will go for us and Isaiah replied then said I here am I send me someone shout send me yes. say send me Lord send me. shout it say send me Lord, send me, Lord. say I am, I am available I am willing I am, I am yielded am one more time say I am available I am, I am, willing. I am willing I am yielded I am in Luke chapter 1 and verse 38 angel Gabriel comes to Mary revealing to her God's program that Jesus is about to show up in the flesh the word incarnate is about to wear a material body and walk within the frame of this earth and that she had been privileged selected by God now it was up to her to partner with God she asked a few questions like every human should how shall these things be seeing that I know not a man and the angel explained to her by the time we get to verse 38 Mary said behold the handmaid of the Lord I like this he never said behold the woman behold I, I donate myself if this is what God wants to do behold the handmaid of the Lord he says be it unto me not just according to my desire be it unto me according to your word do you know the angel never left till he got this answer the angel brought a message. You would think when he was done, he would have said, Mary, whether you like it or not, you must be pregnant. I'm just telling you, be ready. No. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. And Gabriel said, thank you very much. Heaven has gotten the reply and he left. Hmm. I learned this early in life that God is mighty. He can do without me but he has chosen to depend on me. God can do without me, oh. God can do without you. God can do without Koinonia. God can do without Nigeria. He is God by himself. Before Nigeria, before Africa was, before Joshua Selman was, before Koinonia was, God is and he remains God. But when God chooses to incorporate us in his program, we must see that as an eternal privilege. Are we together? 
you must see that as an eternal privilege and then open up your spirit to plunge into what he's doing knowing that God can do without me but my God he has chosen to bring me as part of his end time army God can do without your family but he has chosen to incorporate your family I have always been flattered till I became concerned about why God becomes vulnerable over men. When God begins to pursue a man, sometimes it looks as if he's not God. God will prevail on you. He will send people to beg you. He, God, when you see God looking for a man, sometimes it's embarrassing for God to be doing that kind of thing. And yet he does it without shame. He will run after you. He will send helpers. He will bring you dreams. You will shout at him and say, God, I'm not interested. Then he will wait three more years until your ways bring you to your knees. Then he will come again and say, I'm still there. This is God for you. I wondered for a long time, God, is it that you cannot do without men? You act as if you lost your creativity. This is God for you. Don't let the devil lie to you and say God cannot use you. He can do without you. Settle that for a fact. But find consolation that he has created a space for you in his program. And it doesn't matter who believes in you or who does not believe in you. They may look at you and say you of your family. You think God is stupid. He doesn't have men that he wants to come to this family. This is what changed my life. When I found out that God could do without me but he has chosen to depend on me. It made me feel special. It made me feel unique. And I said, for this, I will run and spend my days honoring that trust. No shadow you will light up, mountain you will climb up, coming after me. No wall you will kick down, lie you will tear down, coming after me. No shadow you will light up. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me. No wall you will kick down. No wall you will kick down. Lie you will tear down. Coming after me. Listen, before we continue, I sense in my heart to speak to someone. God is saying, I'm still waiting for you. I'm still waiting. I started with you on campus, but you left me on the way. I'm still waiting. Even though it is 10 years now, I'm still waiting. You started after a revival meeting, but something distracted you away from me. And the maker is saying, I'm still waiting. Still waiting. I've not changed my plan concerning you. What I told you 20 years ago is still what I'm saying. I would have replaced you but I see the sincerity of your heart and God is coming to you again. He's giving you a chance again. Someone shout again, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Send me to my family. Send me to that business. Send me to the crusade ground. Send me to that prophetic outpost. Send me. I am ready and I'm available. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me, no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. When God insists on finding a man, he becomes vulnerable almost to a point of shame, and he does not mind. He won't force you, but he will pursue you almost with the vulnerability of a fool he will wait for you he will look for you oh god i'm giving birth to children now i don't have time for you i tell you sometimes he can be patient till you give birth to your last child then he comes again he says i met you 12 years ago are you now ready for me i can still use you even though time is gone you can still make the most of the 10 years left This is God for you. Koinonia, this is God for you. 
Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, He chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night tonight. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. That song was for you. God is still looking for you. God is still looking for you. God is not like a man who abandons people. He can be patient. You roam around your life running away from God, but you are still a prophet. That mantle is still hovering around you. You roam around running away from God, but you are still an evangelist. Those souls are still coming. You've not opened your mouth and told God no. And because you've not told him no, he's still patient. He's still patient. He's saying you are still Esther. He's saying you are still Deborah. He's saying you are still Abraham. You are still Gideon. Provided you've not opened your mouth to reject the call, he will still chase after you. shadow you will light up mountain you will climb up coming after me no wall you will kick down lie you will hallelujah please hear me I'm prophesying to someone God is saying I should tell you when you were between the age of 13 and 18 you, you had dreams you had a notebook where you wrote those dreams and God is saying that you have rejected the call but that he's calling you now I'm not saying this to everybody between the age of 13 and 18 you were having visionary encounters God will come to you he showed you things you asked pastors questions they could not answer that thing was a call it was a mantle upon your life and now after many years you try to run away from church, but God has brought you back. You try to do your own thing to live your life. God is saying, I'm still calling you. I'm still calling you to return unto me. And I'm telling you prophetically, you can choose to reject the call, but he's stretching his hands tonight. Return back to that call. 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 You can reject him, but he's stretching his hands. Return back to that call. Those visions were not a waste. The dreams you saw were not a waste. The programs you went to were not a waste. The videos you watched were not a waste. Ale shabarandas kavadiata. Someone shout again, say, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. I am available. I am willing. I am yielded. I am available. I am willing. I am yielded. Listen. 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 Please, I want you to listen to me. I will return back preaching, but I'm prophesying now. I want you to listen to me. I'm hearing in my spirit again. This is particularly to a lady. This is particularly to a lady. The Lord is telling me that I should tell you that there is a healing ministry God promised you. A healing ministry He gave you. But until now, you have not opened up your spirit to receive that anointing it's a healing ministry not just a teaching ministry not just a prophetic ministry is a mighty healing ministry you have seen this many times prophetic words have come concerning it but you see let me tell you for every call there is a consecration that follows calls just because God called you does not mean you will become 
Don't let people die because of rebellion. No. There are people here who have been called by now. You should have been commanding wealth of nations for the sake of the kingdom. But because you have chosen to do it your way, the foolishness of God's way, you see, God's way does not make sense. You can push him and say, I know how to make money by myself. And you keep struggling and going around in circles. If you patiently followed his way, you would have stepped into your Rehoboth. In one minute, can someone cry and say, Lord, I repent, I return, I return, I repent, I repent. I'm tired of going my own way, tired of creating my own programs for my life. Come on, someone is praying. You're following online, pray. I'm tired of inventing my own way to live in my life and my destiny. I'm ready to return to the blueprint. I'm ready to return to the manuscript. No matter how you've deviated, his mercy can bring you back. Lord, you called me a worshiper. I'm ready to return to my office. You called me a worshiper. You called me a businessman. You called me an entrepreneur for the kingdom. Take a minute to pray. That genuine prayer of repentance. To repent means to realign. To repent means to realign. To repent means to realign. Take a minute. Let it be genuine repentance from your spirit. I cannot lose this call. There is so much that is vested upon my life. Someone is praying. In Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray please sit down so the manifestation of God's desire and plan on the earth depends on the availability the willingness and the yieldedness of the saints now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to give me your rapt attention. I know that the Spirit of God is moving across. But if you can sit on the ground, sit on the ground. Don't worry, we're an organized people. But in this atmosphere, you will still fall down again. So just sit on the ground with your notebook and listen. Hallelujah. What kind of vessel is God looking for? This is what I want you to listen now. Hales, mm. kabarako shatiasa. Krati vale kaparunda skavreski vala haskiata. Siba sevrandi la saba haskia maranduski. Adi shalanda kre kaparusa brigadida shi. Krate sabina shala savrati zavarianta kaparus. Parunda shala gritia. More love. More power. More of you in my life. More love, more power. More of you in my life. Sing more love, more power. More of you. 
listen carefully as much as God desires to use everybody the unfortunate reality is that he may not use everybody because there are conditions to be used by God this latter rain you see that is already sweeping across the nations this latter rain this end time outpouring that is resting on families churches men women of God captains of industry refer to my message redefining the coming revival I give perspective there to how the move of God happens how a true revival happens but I want to show you and this is the point of emphasis this is the zenith of my discourse tonight what kind of a vessel is God looking for what kind of a man I want to describe for you the kind of man the Spirit is looking for that as the Holy Spirit is moving across Abuja moving across Koinonia moving across the churches in this nation moving across men of God not every man of God will be featured in this move of God not every church will be featured in this move of God God wants everybody to be part of it but there are conditions not every financier will be involved I have read this in scripture but I have seen this in my visions many times God called 12 disciples it was in their destiny for all of them to serve his purposes but one by one from Judas to doubting Thomas they began to redefine their destinies there was no place written in the Bible that Judas was the one who would betray Jesus mm -mm. there was a prophecy about betrayal but not Judas he made himself available can I tell you like a movie there are many parts to play you can choose to work for the devil and choose a path that fights the program of God even if you are a Christian or you can choose to align to the ways of God and find yourself promoting his purposes but work with me as I show you by the Spirit of God and I sense that there will be mighty impartations as I'm reading this because I started sensing this even while I was praying at home do you know why this message is coming with such spiritual reactions because it is a cry in the heart of the spirit smith wigglesworth will call it the cry of the spirit is something that is at the center of god's program now we look to yahweh yahweh our hope is yahweh yahweh we look to Yahweh, Yahweh, forever Yahweh, Yahweh. We look to Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Our hope is Yahweh. Sit down and prepare to write. What kind of a vessel is God looking for? Is he looking for everyone? Will he use everyone under any condition? No. Number one, God is looking for a man who desires to know him write it down this is the first kind of man God is looking for this is the first kind of man the latter rain is looking for this end time anointing you see this end time outpouring this grace that will turn men literally to be like gods is not looking for every kind of vessel God is looking for a man a people a vessel that have an ever increasing desire to know him Daniel eleven thirty two. 32 but the people that 
do know their God, they shall be strong and shall do exploits. The people that do know their God is the reason why the spirit of revelation is preceding the move of God because it is impossible to serve a God you do not know. It is impossible to be passionate about a God you do not know. Jeremiah chapter 9, 23 and 24. The Bible says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, it says. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Next verse. It says, But let him that glory yet, believers hear this, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. The knowledge of God. The kind of men that this latter rain will fall on are men and women who are ready to pay the price to know God. Not just to pay the price to receive from God. The price to know God. I can tell you by the authority of scripture and I can tell you from experience it takes time to know God. No matter how God simplifies himself, it would take time and the grace of the Spirit for any man to know God. First John or John 17, John 17 and verse 3, Jesus is praying and he says, This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Remember in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses had an encounter with the God of the Bible, that should be what verse now? Let's try 13, I think 13 to 17. Moses, Exodus, is that it? Okay, beautiful. Moses said unto God, follow carefully, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? He's asking God, What shall I tell them? What shall I say? Give me an answer. 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Reading to 17. And, the go and God said, Moreover, unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Two more verses. Go, he says, gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done unto you in Egypt. The final verse. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. But Moses needed to know the person sending him. Those that God is going to be using are people who pay the price to know God. Refer to my teaching, Knowing God. I have done several teachings about knowing God. But for the purpose of this discussion, According to scripture, there are three major ways that we learn God. Number one, we know God by studying his character. Number two, we know God by studying his ways. Number three, we know God by studying his power. These are the three dimensions to learning God. Let me repeat again. We know God by learning his character. We know God by learning his modus operandi, his ways. We know God by learning his power. Paul prayed this in Ephesians chapter 1. And he prayed that the eyes of our understanding be flooded with light, he says, that we may know the hope of his calling 
and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance through the saints and then verse 19 the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe that was his prayer you want to know God God can be known not all of him can be known in this side of God's kingdom because our minds as potent as they are are still finite we cannot exhaust the knowledge of God it will take eternity to learn God even in heaven we will still be learning God but that he's broken himself to dimensions that can be affordable for our minds and our spirits to receive. We can know God by learning his character. His character can help us know who he is, different from other gods, different from other spirits. We can know God by learning his ways. Then we know how God operates and we know how God does not work. Finally, we can know God when we see his power when we see his power we can believe him that should be john 2 23 did i get that right that scripture just came into my spirit now when he was in jerusalem at the passover in the feast day the bible says many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did they didn't just believe there was something they saw that made them believe in him John chapter 2 and verse 11 this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and the disciples believed on him he said if you would not believe me for the things that I've said believe me for the work's sake miracles point men to Jesus are we learning now so those that God will be using are not men and women who will stand on the battlefield and they are confused as to the one who sent them. No, we must be people of knowledge, people of power. When David stood before Goliath, listen to me. Goliath is a prophetic representation of the gates of hell, the adversary that stands against the purposes of God. And David was standing representing the ones who are carrying this latter rain, this new wine of the spirit. David stands before Goliath and Goliath says, am I a dog? And David says, you come to me with your bow and your spears, but I come to you in a name as touching a God that I know. Can I tell you the truth? Let's not make the mistake of the men in Athens. Paul passed through Athens and he saw people worshiping and there was an inscription on their altar to the unknown God. There are still many people singing songs to an unknown God, preaching sermons about an unknown God, writing books about an unknown God, calling services to worship an unknown God. God is calling upon us to press to know him. You can know God. You can learn God. As mysterious and as mighty as God is, he gave us the advantage of scripture. He gave us the advantage of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the advantage of the teaching priest to work together in synergy and to help the saints know him. But I know whom I have believed. You can know who you believe. Not just believe because a pastor said so. You can know that I believe a God of power. I believe a God of wisdom. I believe the God that restores. I believe in El Shaddai. I believe in Jireh. You can know him. The men who will experience the latter rain are men who pay the price to know God. While you are learning God, you will look like a fool. Because many other things in your life may have to be temporarily suspended while you place priority on knowing him. Can I tell you, there is a level of busyness you cannot have and know God. That does not mean you will not pursue your career, don't get me wrong. That does not mean you will not be involved in many things. But for that project of knowing God, you will have to cut away unnecessaries and coordinate every time you can find to invest it in knowing God. There is profit 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 in knowing God. 
when you know God you will be strong when you know God you will be dexterous you will be audacious not by blindly shouting not bold face for nothing David stood before Goliath and said this is how you will die on account of the confidence of the God that backs me I will throw you down with this sling and I will use your own sword and cut your head and feed it to the birds of the air and he did exactly that because the people that do know their God koinonia they shall be strong strong in the marketplace strong in their places of work strong in the family strong in school strong in this bedeviled world they shall be strong when you lack capacity the diagnosis is that you need to feed your spirit with sufficient knowledge of God we live in a world of mistaken identity where people are under pressure to become anything that people want unfortunately if you do not know God you can never know who you are because who you are is derived from who he is so you want to rediscover yourself the basis for your confidence by the way I was having a discussion with someone I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday and the person asked me and said if there are two things you want me to know what would they be I would say number one pay the price to know who you are if you do not know who you are he was going to get into a particular sector and I told him that is a vicious place if you do not know who you are and you get into that sector you may become several things depending on whose mirror you are looking at you look at the mirror of a loser you will see something else you look at the mirror of a defeated person you look at the mirror of a mediocre you look at the mirror of a champion all kinds of people in life and destiny will flash different mirrors from the lens of their excellence or the lens of their limitations and they will want you to define yourself from the lens of their mirror it's time to push away every mirror and look to the original authentic mirror as we behold him as in a glass the Bible says we are changed you look at the wrong mirror you'll be correcting things you should not correct it was the mirror that is wrong not you and yet you'll be forced to correct so many things are we together you may be a patient and a kind person loving and very temperate but you will look at a particular mirror a sociological mirror and that mirror will interpret those attributes as foolishness and say you better change them if you want to survive and a kind person will suddenly become a wicked person like a beast and the mirror said that's right you are right now then you turn to another mirror and you see the mirror of a mediocre and it says what profit is there pressing towards a great life and destiny it will bring you to a point of laziness and irresponsibility and based on that mirror it will judge you all right be careful before you assess yourself verify what mirror you are looking at our world today has all kinds of mirror society has their mirror social media your social media has their mirror my goodness that one they have a plethora of mirrors even Jesus if he looks through that mirror he may see himself with horns <laughs> are we together now social media for you our world has mirror Africa as a continent we have our mirror culture has its mirror we men of God and women of God as leaders we have our own big mirror that has been tampered and battered by religion and everybody is presenting that mirror and you have been assessing yourself using many mirrors let me propose to you that any mirror that is inconsistent with this mirror is lying to you you will never truly know yourself. You will never truly know what you have. You will never truly know what you can do until you look to the mirror of scripture. You believe that? When you know who you are and what God has made you become, it becomes inconsequential what else people, time, sociology, whatever says about you. Are we together? Your confidence in life is derived from the stability of who you know you are in light of who Christ is there is a, a cancer of mistaken identity that is eating up our world and my, I feel sincerely I'm a young man 
but I feel for the younger generation coming, there is such confusion about identity. Listen, if you're a parent here and you have any children under 20, begin to pray and fast for them because this world right now is redefining people's identity. They can call a wise man a fool and the wise man will believe he's a fool. They can call a Christian a prey and the Christian believes he's a prey. They can call an intelligent person a dummy and he believes he's a dummy. Just because many people are saying the same wrong thing does not make it right mistaken identity we are raising a generation with no bankrupt of conviction people cannot stand to say listen i believe this about god and i believe this about me when you become that weak you cannot carry the latter rain because confronting the gates of hell will demand sometimes that you stand alone and in standing alone you must stand based on the consciousness of who you are The second thing I told the gentleman was I said, if you want to rise, the secret is not just productivity. The secret is humility. You can be productive, but there is a limit to which you rise because skill can only lift you so far. It is the hand of God that lifts men beyond the frequency of skill and productivity. And according to scripture, the secret to exaltation is that you humble yourself in the sight of God. Is that in your Bible? And the Bible says, he shall lift you. Who will lift you? Men cannot lift you. God can use men. One of the many things you need to run away from is pride. Let me submit to you that there is a healthy balance between confidence and pride. There are many people in a bid to manage confidence. They have tilted to pride. It doesn't work that way. You can be settled with confidence knowing who you are. And yet you carry that air of genuine humility. It is a powerful thing when you are great and humble. When you are great and humble, you become more marketable. You become more delightsome. People will always want to come because humility adds a garnishing to your skill. It adds a garnishing to your greatness. Pride reduces the value of anything. Anything plus pride has its value reduced. Anointing plus pride will reduce the potency of that anointing. A gifted person who is arrogant will reduce the power, the impact. Pride is a diminisher at any level if you want to see exaltation in your life let humility become a code a creed a covenant that governs your life and I show you the way up and I show you the way to stay up number two what kind of men is God looking for in this end time the latter rain is looking for very specific people by the way i hope you know just to add to this that when we talk about those who desire to know god let me remind you that the knowledge of god demands your time demands your consecration and devotion demands your study of the word demands your fellowship with the spirit in prayer and worship let me repeat this again just to really wrap up and do justice to point one. When the Bible talks about men who desire to know God, this is the implication. Men that are willing to give God time. Men that are willing to submit to the requisite consecration and devotion. Every mantle and every anointing has a consecration requirement. You don't just carry the mantle, you also embrace the responsibility of that consecration. How about study of the word? Can I tell you, I have not found any gift of study of the word in scripture. The study of the word like prayer is labor. The Bible calls it labor in the word and doctrine. It is not convenient. Your, your stamina is built by the value you know you will derive for every time you invest in the word. And then how about your fellowship with the spirit in prayer and worship? 
you want to access the latter rain, it will come on the wings of these, including prayer and your time spent in worship. Now, number two, the latter rain and even God himself is looking for a man who will truly and wholeheartedly love him. This is the second kind of man that God is looking for. This is the second kind of man that God can use, will use. A man and a vessel who will truly, write that down, and wholeheartedly love him. It starts with knowing God, but it does not stop with knowing God. The more you know God, the more you love him. Love is enhanced by knowledge. It is difficult to love properly in ignorance. There are things that you can know that can make you or enhance your love. The root of love, genuine agape, is that it is unconditional, but it can be enhanced when you know certain things. Are we together? There are things you know about God that makes you to love him more. There are things you know about men that makes you to love them more. John chapter 22, 36 and 37. John 22, 36 and 37. Luke, is, did I get that right? Is it Matthew? Let's try it. My apologies. I think I missed something now. Let's try Matthew 22, 36, 37. Master, that's right. Please correct it. It's Matthew. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? They were asking Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Koinonia, let's read together. One to go. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Uh -huh, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. One more time. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The common word there is all. All. Whatever facet of you, it must be all of it. Not some of your heart, mixed with some of your soul, mixed with some of your mind. It is all or never. The business of loving Jesus demands your all to respond to him. God is looking for men and women who love him. Ephesians chapter 3, 17 and 19. 17 down to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Watch this now. That ye, being rooted, my God, and grounded in love, uh -huh, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. God is looking for men who truly and wholeheartedly love him. Please shout that word love. Say love. love. One more time. Love. Most revivals died and most moves of God have suffered because the love component was not added to power. The love component was not added to miracles. The love component, self in most moves, replaced love. So the longevity factor in that move also died. There remained these three, faith, hope, and love. And the Bible says, your Bible says, the greatest of the three, faith that moves mountains, hope that maketh not ashamed, is said of the three, the greatest is love. There are three proofs from scripture that you love God. Let me give it to you. Buttressing on the second point. Don't tell me, apostle, I love God. Verify using these indices now that I'll recite for you. There are three biblical proofs. There might be many, but I found in my study that there are three biblical proofs that a man loves God. Are you ready? Number one, the first proof that you love God genuinely is that he becomes your priority he becomes your priority he becomes your priority that's the first proof that you love god he becomes your priority exodus chapter 23 to 5 
he becomes your priority you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty O oh, morning star you truly are everything listen as beautiful as this song is for many people unfortunately it remains a song it is not a sincere experience what is the proof that you love God you want the latter rain to rest upon you that end time anointing to come upon you you want to be mightily used by God you must love God genuinely and wholeheartedly and the first proof is that he becomes your priority three and four Exodus 20 thou shall have no other gods before me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or is in the water under the earth now look at this when you read this scripture religiously it's easy for you to feel you are free and you are guilty from this but you will be surprised how many people have made the same mistake of Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar created an image of himself and asked men to worship it we still do that today as men of God we still do that today as businessmen it is very lucrative to create a stature of yourself this time around it may not be made with gold and silver but you edge it in the minds of people our pressure to be idols in the hearts of people is there is such a hunger there is such a panting to be the idol of people thou shall have no gods including yourself before me ministry can be an idol anointing can be an idol revelation can be an idol charisma can be an idol it's not only something you mold out of bricks and mortar it is not something you mold out of wood that cannot talk cannot speak and tie a red band around it no idolatry has graduated right now it has become a software that exists in the minds of people when I exalt myself more than Christ and I want you to remember me rather than Christ the celebrity mentality has eaten into the church eating into us men of God eating into business people our passion to be at the center stage you rather forget about God and remember Joshua Selman and because we spiritualize that idolatry we think it is right it is still idolatry you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty oh morning star you truly are the first proof that you love God is that he becomes your priority second Chronicles let's hurry up 15 12 to 15 second Chronicles write that scripture down and please do not forget it second Chronicles 15 12 to 15 and they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart you see the word all again and with all their soul uh-huh that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death whether small or great whether man or woman 14 and they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting with trumpets and cornets and all Judah rejoiced at the oath. Watch this. For they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And my Bible says he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. God is looking for people who love him by making him the ultimate priority. Second, how do you know? that you love God are you ready obedience 
Obedience is the second biblical proof that you love God. Obedience is greater than any sacrifice you will make. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. Obedience is the second biblical proof that you love God. And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul. Say obedience. John chapter 4 and verse 21. I like that scripture. I found it many years ago and it's blessed me. 1421, my apologies. John 1421. It says, He that keepeth my commands, or he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. It says, And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Apostle, I love the Lord with all my heart. Let me see your passion for obedience. If obedience is found wanting, your love for the Lord is found wanting. Are we learning? So the first biblical index to measure your love for Christ is not just professing, not just verbalizing, not just singing, that he becomes your priority in truth and in experience exalted above ministry exalted above your pursuit i wish that were true for many of us but unfortunately it is not he's not yet priority and then number two obedience number three let's hurry up what is the third biblical proof that you love the lord are you ready for this love for the brethren the third biblical proof, my God, is the church so wanting in this area, so guilty in this area. Love for the brethren. First John chapter 4 and verse 20. Shout it with me when you see it projected, please. First John 2, 2 4, 20. Ready? One to read. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. One more time. If a man say, I love God, and hated his brother he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he had seen how can he love God whom he had not seen this is written in plain English there are many proposed lovers of God having such a growing disdain and bitterness and hatred one for another within the body in business in ministry the Bible says you are a liar if you claim you love God and love and hate cannot coexist like that because perfect love does not just drive out fear it drives out anything that is not love hmm. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 love for the brethren it says be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another you want to show that you love jesus you must love his body i cannot claim to love the head and hate the body if i say i love you it will be stupid of me to mean i love your hair or i love your head if you discover what i've been saying is that i love your hair you will remove the hair and drop it and say go and love it there because that hair is not me am i right on that I love your wig or I love your wivon. It's not the same as I love you. Huh? That's what many people are telling the Lord. I love the head. And that is because they have not met the head. By the time they see the head, they say, no, I prefer the body. I really hate the head. <laughs> are we together? You cannot say you love God whom you have not seen and yet hate your brother. Let me show you something. Love is a very powerful force I have learned this as a man of God I have learned this as a believer the Bible says love never fails and when I talk about love I don't just limit it to emotional affection are we together if you are waiting for pleasant circumstances that create connection your love will not be genuine because the Bible says while we were yet sinners undeserving Christ loved us 
Hallelujah. It is love that will make you to preach to somebody and you see that person and it looks like he will never be saved, yet you insist. It is love that will make you as a man of God to pay the price and labor, open your heart, teaching God's people the truth, whether you are rewarded or not. It is love that will make you wake up in the night while others are sleeping and you are praying and interceding for the people that God has brought your way. It is love that makes you to spend everything you have, your resources and your all. Everybody say love. A substitute to love is hypocrisy, religiosity, are we together? Psychophancy, and all that are within that list. God is telling you that those who will receive the latter rain are not hypocrites. Not those who stand and say, I love you with hate and bitterness within their hearts. No. I hope you know that hatred is a signature of the presence of evil. Is that true? The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but it says overcome evil, not with evil. You overcome evil with good. Eternally, evil is more, I mean, good is more superior to evil. It was love that defeated death on the cross. Love will always defeat death. Love will always triumph over hatred. Are we together? Ah, possible, but this one, just jump this hole, go to the third one, let's round up. You don't know the situation around. I don't even want to tell you what, who did, what that person did. Ten years ago, the person slapped me in public and I vowed that for as long as I'm alive, that hand must go. Look, let me tell you the truth. The man talking to you is not stupid. Love will always triumph over evil. Love will make you look like a fool for a moment. Love will make you look like you are weak for a moment. But step back and watch the power of love. Love raised Christ from the dead. Love crucified sin, Satan, death, hell and the grave once and for all. There is nothing love cannot do. You have tried hate and it did not work. Try the way of love. Apostle, but if I love people like that, people will take me for granted. When my head started getting hot, I started getting answers. Let me tell you the truth. Because I know Nigerians. Love is not as weak as you think it is. Maybe it is your definition. Are we together? I hope you know that judgment is still a subset of love. <laughs> so when I say love, maybe one day we'll teach on love. So that you will understand. Love has dimension, so length, breadth, height, width, all is love. But I can tell you, love will always triumph over hate. Hallelujah. Someone looks at you in the office and insults you and said, very dull woman, you were queried by everybody. I still don't know why you are at this work. And tomorrow you are going back to the same person again. Make up your mind that no matter what he or she says, you choose the way of love. Can I tell you, when you practice love and you allow God to judge, you will even be the one to beg God and say it's too much. Most people don't know what love can do. See what God did to Satan. That blow that was dealt to Satan came on account of love. Every time you see weakness, be afraid of it because weakness is greater than strength. It was weakness that killed strength. Strength did not kill weakness. For when we are weak, then indeed we are strong. It's a mystery in the spirit. Are you learning now? Yeah. Because many of us have this pressure to show that you enter a restaurant and someone is eyeing you, say, you don't know me, oh. I'm a Christian with a difference. I will beat you here and still go to church. That's how I kept quiet and people were looking down. I've changed. I'm not like that. Tell apostle, I respect you, I honor you, but this one, you, I mean, I will beat the living daylight out. <laughs> ah, body of Christ. Now, wow. <laughs> Are we together? I will drop my Bible, tie my, uh, this thing they do. I beat the living daylight. I go and ask God for forgiveness. But at least I'm satisfied that I've injured you. <laughs> Sometimes I put myself in the position of God. I just imagine that I'm sitting on a throne and watching my creation and seeing all the things that people do. Then in the evening, they are still crying unto Him again. 
Lord God of Abraham, I said, hey! <laughs> Hallelujah. Say in the name of Jesus, the love of God is at work in me. Shout it. Say in the name of Jesus, the love of God is at work in me. It says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You quote it every week. Now have it with understanding. The love of God and the koinonia, the fellowship, the sharing together of the Holy Spirit. It says let it be with you all. Amen. Those who will carry this latter rain those who will be drenched by this latter rain that will be given the honor of representing the purposes of God in a very mighty way are men and women who love God, love Jesus genuinely. They love him by making him their priority. They love him by their determination to obey him. And they love him by their love for his body, their love for the brethren. Number three, what kind of man, what kind of vessel is God looking for? Are you ready? God is looking for men. God is looking for vessels who will serve him beyond knowing him, beyond loving him. The third and final level, if you will experience this outpouring and if you will be used by God, is there must be a commitment and a determination to serve him just because you know him does not guarantee that you will serve him in fact just because you love him does not guarantee that you will serve him romans 12 11 god is looking for men god is looking for vessels who will serve him not slothful in business koinonia fervent in spirit serving the Lord not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the Lord what does it mean to serve the Lord to serve the Lord means to be a contributor to the birthing and the manifestation of his will to serve the Lord does not just mean to be a worker in church it means to be an active contributor to the birthing and the manifestation of his will, of his program. That's what it means to serve God. You can be in church as an attendant, as a member, as a participant, and yet not serve God. To serve the Lord again means to be an active participant, an active part of birthing, an active part of manifesting his will, his program, his purposes this is what it means to serve the Lord the Bible says not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the Lord serving the Lord serving the Lord God is looking for men who are prepared to serve him with their time listen God is looking for men who are prepared to serve him with their energy god is looking for men who are prepared to serve him with their giftings god is looking for men who are prepared to serve him with their resources deuteronomy chapter 28 47 and 48 it tells you the consequences of rejecting the honor of serving god because thou servest not the lord thy god with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, 48. Therefore shall thou serve thy enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. In any case, you are going to have to serve the Lord, or you will serve things, serve pain, serve poverty serve mediocrity serve sickness or serve satan directly you are not given the liberty to not serve 
you are only given the liberty of who you will serve hallelujah you want to experience God's power ladies and gentlemen isn't it amazing how that there are so many people who want this anointing there are so many people who, when they hear about revival their hearts are ever open but they do not want to serve God not with their resources not with their giftings not with their time not with their energy I made up my mind that for as long as I'm alive everything I am and everything God has given me must join me in serving him I will never serve the Lord and then my money will not serve him my money must join me to serve him my energy must join me in serving him my gift and skill and everything that constitutes an advantage in my life must join me if I worship him my resources must worship him the grace must worship him anointing must worship him everything must worship him for some of you God is telling you that your service is wanting because there are aspects of you that cannot serve the Lord some of you your time cannot serve the Lord hallelujah isn't it amazing there are many people when they come to church they are itching 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 but after service they will lean on their car for three hours discussing business so where were they rushing to it's just that your time is not prepared to serve the Lord there are many people their giftings and their skill cannot serve the Lord they are exceptionally gifted there are gifted vocalists gifted singers and worshipers gifted people skilled professionally but they cannot serve in the house of God nor will they serve the purposes of God anytime they hear that God is doing something it's none of their business you know I've been touched and humbled as we prepare for our conferences coming and even for our regular koinonia meetings there are people who may not be directly part of this fold in terms of membership and commitment but my God their passion to serve God not just with resources their time there are people who send text messages apostle just to find out how is this happening we are praying we trust God if there's any way we can come in we are prepared and I say who are you and sometimes they say you don't know me but we are people who we've been blessed by your life and ministry and just to let you know we're praying serve God with your time serve God with your energy the worst is this finance thing ah people don't want to serve God with money <laughs> hallelujah once you mention money like this people say wrap up now apostle just leave money now don't talk about it this is why many people are poor did you hear what I said is the reason why many believers are poor can I tell you forgive all those who may have manipulated you and manipulated you financially but let me announce to you by the integrity of Scripture that it is impossible to serve God genuinely with your resources and remain down except it's not the God of the Bible you are serving this is not something I was told this is something I have tested I have served God and I will serve God forever with my resources. Koinonia has served God and will serve God forever with its resources. We are never down, not serving God. If you serve God and you go down, it may be foolishness in other areas that you may need to balance, but it is not the service of God that brought you down. Hallelujah. God has done things in my life today that I will spend eternity saying thank you for on account of service. When you serve God, it's not only money that comes to you. Wisdom comes to you. Favor comes to you. The loyalty of men come to you. You can't buy that with any money. You can pay for an auditorium, but you can't bring people to come and sit down and listen and to be loyal to your grace. Let me challenge you, dear believers, hear me. It pays to serve Jesus. The old hymn says, I sing from my heart. But now many people have not only forgotten the song, but the spirit behind it. We sing that our best is what we give the Lord. Let me challenge you. If you want to be a host of this end time anointing, you want to be a host of this outpouring, you want to be a strong participant, you want to benefit from it. I hope you know this outpouring is not just going to raise prophets and apostles and evangelists and teachers and pastors. This outpouring will raise kingdom billionaires, not millionaires. 
I have seen this. Men who have the wealth of nations, but their grace is laced with humility. They will send billions for the gospel and not make noise about it. How about men and women in leadership? How about men and women in influence? This is what God seeks to do. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. God is calling us tonight and he's challenging us by the spirit. I'm blowing the trumpet in Zion tonight and I'm sounding the alarm to the body of Christ upon God's holy mountain that the move of God that has begun and is gaining momentum per day, per moment, per season. There are many people who are standing believing that by default they will be participants. They might be disappointed. There are conditions. It is true that the move of God has come to stay. I assure you by the integrity of scripture it will not be lost. Regardless the frailty of the body, God's jealousy has defended that move. It has come to stay. It will fulfill its cause. The souls to be saved from this move will be saved. The lives to be transformed from this move will be transformed. The destinies to be birthed and enhanced from this move will be birthed and enhanced. The churches to be established will be established. The prayer lives to be grounded will be grounded. The lives, the deliverances, the healings, everything that is in the loins of prophecy as driven by this revival none will fail because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it and his hand will make it good but you see not everyone who desires to be part of this move will be part of this move some will be spectators some will be mockers of the move sadly and I'm not talking of unbelievers there are many Christians who will be mockers of the move there are many Christians who will be spectators freelancing their passions and not knowing that this was the reason why they came but there are others i pray that they do not become a few many others who will hold on to that claw with the determination of a faithful steward and drive it to the finish line my call for you tonight is that you become part of this glorious army knowing that there is a call upon your life knowing that there is destiny beckoning on you knowing that there are many people who are depending on your faithfulness your continuity your evolving your becoming many people are depending on your own stamina to stand many people are depending on your own staying power when you dwindle and you chicken out your reversal would translate to the fall of many and so the bible says haven't done all to stand says that stand in prayer stand in fasting stand as you study the word stand as you learn god stand as you come to church stand as you obey god stand as you learn him stand as you love him stand as you serve him if you want to know the lord genuinely if you desire to love him in an ever increasing measure if your heart is stayed on serving him forever then I welcome you to that threshing floor where like the threshing floor of Naboth you will stand there as a vessel that is dead to self and watch the latter rain come upon you turning your wilderness to a fruitful vine and your fruitful vine to a forest for many of us the salvation of many have been given to our hands do not fail God the prosperity of many has been given to your hands do not fail God the encouragement that will come to many has been given to your hands do not fail God the influence of the kingdom has been vested upon your shoulder do not fail God the creativity of the kingdom is your job description as far as this move of God is concerned do not fail God make up your mind that as far as it depends on me God's program will not die. As far as it depends on me, God's program will not be aborted. As far as it depends on me, God's program will not fail. The Spirit of God is the Lord of the harvest. He's the captain of the host of that army. He's leading us and we're marching faithfully, triumphantly, sacrificially, but joyfully. His presence is the guarantee that the mission will not fail. His presence is the guarantee that the program will not fail. 
His presence is the guarantee that your call and your election will not be lost. His presence is the guarantee that your assignment will not fail. His presence is the guarantee that your family will not go down, that your ministry will not go down, that your destiny will not go down, that though your beginning be small for someone here, that your latter will greatly increase the presence of the Spirit. Even when you do not trust your ability, trust the Spirit who is leading you. Even though you do not trust your intelligence, after all, the Bible already says in Proverbs 3 and verse 5, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, it says, and to lean not onto your own understanding. The next verse says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Verse 7 says, be not wise in your own eyes. It says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Koinonia, body of Christ, God has instructed me tonight to blow this trumpet in Zion and to announce to you by the Spirit that the latter rain has begun. The latter rain is not beginning, it has begun. In Abuja, in Lagos, somewhere in northern Nigeria, somewhere in south, south Nigeria, there is somebody in his room right now preparing for that revival and he's beginning to see the droplets. What is this that is coming on me? The name is the latter rain. It will come as strange anointings, strange empowerments, strange mantles. There are mantles that have left the body of Christ. They are returning back. It's like the cloud that Elijah was calling in prayer. We are seeing the fist of a man's hand, but it will not remain as small as a man's hand. It's an avalanche, an outpour of rain. And Joel said, it shall come to pass in the latter days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will see visions. Your young men will prophesy. It says, even upon the handmaid, everyone can be a part of this move. Rise up on your feet and let's pray for a minute. Father, in this outpouring, this awakening, this revival, this move of the Spirit that is springing forth from this place, from this nation, from this continent and spreading like an inferno, spreading like an avalanche to the nations of the earth. I open up my heart and my spirit and I declare that I'm a vessel available, willing and yielded to be used by you. Go ahead and pray. Pray from your heart. Pray with passion. Pray with fire. Pray with zest. Pray with zeal. Pray with conviction. Pray. Take a minute to pray. From the rising of the sun right on till it's going down I will sing of the mercies of the Lord Are you praying? From the rising of the sun right on till it's going down I will sing of the glory of the Lord I will sing of the glory of the Lord With my mouth will I make it known From the rising of the sun Right on till it's going down I will sing of the mercies of the Lord I will sing of the glory of the Lord I will sing of the power of the Lord. I will sing of the wisdom of the Lord. I will sing of the favor of the Lord. With my mouth will I make it known. From the rising of the sun, Right on till it's going down I will sing of the mercies of the Lord Hear me? 
Someday we are going to stand before Jesus, whether you like it or not. When this life folds like a curtain, you and I will stand, except that I will not stand as a preacher. The name apostle will not be called that day. The name koinonia will not be called that day. You will stand as an individual responsible for your use of the gift of life that has been given unto you. That is the day when the pride of many will fail them. That is the day when the motives that lead men will be revealed. That is the day when the purity of your service and the basis of your pursuit will be tested. Hear me. That day we will stand like the man who was given five talent and the other two and the last one. The Bible says he demanded accountability from them. And for the first two, they received very warm commendations. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in little. I will make you a ruler of many. One of the synoptic accounts will say, Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I pray that you do not become like the one person. He stood there in anger, full of bitterness and offense, did not know that he also had a talent, even though his own was one. But he was going to be ranked and assessed based on his use of that one. I know you are a hard man, he said. You like to reap where you did not sow. And so I thought instead of throwing it, I buried it in the ground. Here is your talent. And he said, you are a wicked and unprofitable servant. If you knew that I was a hard man, why did you not keep it at the bank so that at least it will have some interest at my coming? And he says to be cast into eternal damnation where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I have made a commitment with my life that in life and in death, I will spend my life pursuing the knowledge of God, growing my love for Jesus genuinely beyond ministry and spending my life, my days, my time, my skill, my resources and everything he's given me as an advantage to serve his purposes for as long as I live. I'm praying that as you step out of this place tonight, it will not be that you just came to church and enjoyed an intelligently presented sermon by a man of God, but that you leave with an imprint of this call. See it as a shofar that has been blown to your spirit. See it as a clarion call that God is calling you to be part of this glorious army and to be serious when you open up your heart to be part of it. Knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, serving Jesus, your knowledge of him, your loving him, and your serving him in its entirety. These are the end time requirements to hosting and being drenched in the latter rain. Let me call tonight a very special group of people. Those who want to make Jesus Lord of their lives. When I began my teaching, I shouted it for a few minutes here that at the back of this outpouring and in order of priority is a massive harvest. Many coming and translating from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And whilst you heard me teach, you heard this preacher shouting at the top of his voice. The Spirit of God began to speak to you. This is why I brought you to church. This is why you are seated at the overflow, at the balcony. This is why you are connecting online. This is why you are here in the main auditorium. And I want to give you a chance as touching the love and the mercy of Jesus. You are in this place and you are saying, Apostle, I cannot say sincerely that I'm saved. Perhaps I may consider myself a good person, but I cannot say I have made this conscious decision. Or you are here and you are saying, I've just been around the things of church. I don't consider myself to be a bad person, but I'm not sure. I cannot guarantee that I'm currently walking with Jesus in spirit and in truth. I want to make these two calls in one. And I want you to have the boldness. Don't be ashamed. Don't look around. You're following online, you are in this place, you are across the balcony, all the overflows, outside, wherever you are. I want you to leave your seat right now and let me request that you come and stand before me. Give me the honor of praying and introducing you to Jesus and introducing Jesus to you. I'll count one to five. Leave your seat as you come. One, 
From the rising of the sun Right on till it's going down I will sing of the mercies of the Lord Keep clapping Koinonia From the rising of the sun Right on till it's going down I will sing of the mercies of the Lord If you're joining them, come quickly From the rising of the sun Right on till it's going down more time from the rising of the sun right until it's going down i will sing of the mercies of the lord a few seconds for you to catch up please if you're coming rush hurry if you are at any of the overflows you can just walk to your led screen and for those who are making this prayer online across all of our expressions please make sure your heart is open and you are prepared to join them as you pray this prayer thank you sir come thank you ma come thank you jesus said you are not ashamed of me before men i will not be ashamed of you before my father and his holy angels hallelujah praise the name of the lord Thank you for making this noble decision. Let me tell you, this is the wisest decision that any man can make in this side of God's kingdom. More superior to any decision you have made and will make in your life. The wisest decision known to mankind is the decision to receive the life of Jesus and to surrender everything unto him. And I thank you for not letting the crowd distract you Thank you for winning that war and the, the courage that you have summoned to come here. I want to pray with you. May I request that you lift your right hand high above your head as a sign of surrender. Please say this after me and let it be from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus. One more time and truthfully so say it. Say, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I have heard your word. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive your life into my spirit and I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight, and forever I'm a child of God I go forward ever and backward never amen keep your beautiful hands lifted father thank you for this once the Bible declares that as many who will come to you you will in no wise cast away they have come declaring your Lordship over their lives and I pray in the name of Jesus that the power and the grace the keeping grace the grace that sustains us through this journey let it rest upon you I call you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, bona fide recipients of the life of God. And based on the authority of scripture, I declare your sins forgiven. And I cause every spirit that will not let you rest, that would distract you from walking in victory and walking in righteousness. I release you right now. Let that influence live your life forever in the name of Jesus Christ. From tonight, you go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Please let me request that you move to my right. There are counselors lifting the placard. They will have a word with you in just a minute and you'll be back to your seat. Let's honor them as they go. God bless you. 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 Celebrate them koinonia. God bless you. Hallelujah. We're wrapping up now. Now unto the Lamb upon the throne We raise time as 
we wrap up. Now on to the Lamb upon the throne, we raise a sound, we raise a sound. Over the nations of the earth. I speak the blessing of the Lord upon your weak beginning in the name of Jesus. Let this be a supernatural week for you. Shout a believing amen. Let this be an extraordinary week for you in the name of Jesus. The helper you've been praying for is finally arriving this week. The favor you've been praying for is finally arriving this week. The mercy you have been crying for is finally arriving this week. The speed you've been believing God for is finally manifesting this week. In the name of Jesus, may this week bring an end to your tears. May this week bring an end to sorrow. May this week bring an end to shame. May this week bring an end to, re to, to, to um, frustrations of any kind. I announce rejoicing for you this week. I announce celebration for you this week. In the name of Jesus, enjoy the help of God. Enjoy the help of man. Enjoy the wisdom of God. Go from glory to glory. You will not die this week. You won't be a victim of accidents. You won't be a victim of the plot of the wicked. This is the week God will judge the wicked on your behalf. You are blessed. Your family is blessed. Your children blessed. Your spouse blessed. Your ministry blessed. Your finances blessed. Return with testimonies. In the name of Jesus. Give Jesus a wave and a clap. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Together, let's share the grace. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I almost forgot. Please allow me give two very important announcements. Lend me a minute. I have to announce this. First is an announcement coming from the medical team. They are currently opened in need of healthcare professionals. Okay, thank you, media, for helping me. They're looking for doctors, as you see, nurses, pharmacists, lab scientists. I shouted serving God here while I was preaching. Here is your chance to be obedient if you love the Lord. The Lord is calling you to serve in this capacity. You can do well to use the link and then register your interest and you can get more information at the PR desk. In a similar vein, the technical and sound department is open. Audio and technical department is welcoming new people. If you are here, and God has granted you grace. They are looking for sound electrical engineers and all who are around sound, light, and um, technical works at all in the house of God. The membership forms can be obtained at the PR desk. The PR desk is just outside once you get out of this auditorium. And then um, I'm not sure there's any other online link. All the people who are interested you are to get the form hard copy and fill it by hand and submit it please do well to be part of this you will add to what God is doing in the house and may God bless you as you respond accordingly in the name of Jesus now we are ready to close let's share the grace together in fellowship the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forever amen surely all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Greet someone by your left and right and see you next week. God bless you. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, 
will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.